we collect probably about 50 million post-consumer juice pouches, 50 to 100 million post-consumer juice pouches per year. Wow. And then we collect another three to 400,000, sorry, three to 400 million uh, uh, factory uh, juice pouch, factory waste juice pouches a year. And we take basically all of America's juice pouch factory waste uh, that exists. That's unbelievable. Hundreds of millions remember, per year. Like, sorry? Hundreds of millions per year. Yeah, like all in about half a billion per year, but that's just on juice pouches. I mean, we collect um, 300 right. types of waste, and that's just juice pouches. Okay, that's awesome. So let me, I just want to clarify that. I'm going to do a formal intro sure. for you. Um, watched all your videos. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I am very excited to have Tom Zaki, who's one of the top eco-friendly entrepreneurs on the planet who's actually saving the planet. Tom is the founder of TerraCycle and his company makes consumer products out of, lack of a better word, garbage. And one example, they've collected over 1.5 million cigarette butts, I think in a year, hundreds of millions of juice pouches. They make goods out of, out of them from backpacks to fence posts, many other things. Tom, thank you for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited because I want to hear your big lessons along the way. And this is, you know, I want to know first, some of your favorite awesome products that you, you've produced from this waste and what they were made out of. Well, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that I, I would, I, when I look at TerraCycle, um, and this has evolved over the past 11 years, but, you know, we view our purpose of, of being, the reason that our company exists, is that we make things that are non-recyclable, recyclable. So, you know, to do that, you need to first collect the garbage, and we offer many different platforms, free platforms, paid platforms, so people can send us their waste. Um, then we process it into cool new things, and then we promote that to make sure people are aware. Mm -hmm. What's important, though, is our internal sort of process doesn't begin with, oh, we want to make a uh, shower curtain, and what type of garbage makes the best shower curtain, because then you're really cherry-picking the very best waste to make the object. Mm -hmm. Instead, what we do is we say, cigarette butts are an issue, or razor blades are an issue, mm -hmm. or pens are an issue, or toothpaste tubes. What could we make them into? Mm -hmm. So when you ask, like, what am I the most proud of or inspired about? It's less to do with the products because our products are sort of our byproduct. Like, I mm -hmm. honestly don't even care if people are aware or buy them because um, they will, uh, uh, you know, find their markets. What I'm really focused on is how do we get more non-recyclable waste streams in? And what I'm really proud of are, you know, sort of two categories of programs. Ones yeah. that have become exceptionally big. So, for example, we collect, I think, around 3% of, of all of the juice pouches in America. And now 3% may seem like a small number, but that's huge, ridiculous amounts on a daily basis. Right. And uh, there's other programs that have grown really quickly, too, like cigarette butts, uh, which we now do in 10 countries around the world, from Japan to Canada to the U.S. and so on. Um, and then uh, uh, the other things that I'm really excited about are unique waste streams, waste streams that people thought would be incredibly challenging to solve, like mm -hmm. chewing gum. Uh, we now can recycle chewing gum or cigarette butts or, uh, uh, you know, and other sort of things. So it's those two aspects, big volume waste streams like coffee capsules all the way to really difficult uh, solutions like dirty diapers. So what is something awesome you created out of chewing gum? Well, so chewing, each type of garbage is different, right? Yeah. And what we do is we first look at the hierarchy of waste. The hierarchy of waste is basically the five possible solutions to garbage. Um, the, the bottom two we never do, which is landfill and incinerate the waste, which are linear and destroy the, uh, uh, the waste. Instead, we look at circular solutions. So we very first look at, is the waste reusable? Chewing gum can't really be reused. It's, you know, Hopefully un unlikely not. to work. <laughs> Um, then we look at upcycling, uh, which is also possible in chewing gum, but you'd more end up with art. Nothing really practically that can be upcycled from it. So then the next step below is recycling, which is absolutely possible in chewing gum because chewing gum is a polymer. It's a rubber polymer, and we can integrate chewing gum into plastic at about 35%. And you can then injection mold that into just about anything you can imagine. So like a Frisbee could be made 35% from used chewing gum and 65% from other types of garbage. That's awesome. Um, so what, I mean, you mentioned a couple things, you know, it's, what's the hardest component of the business? Because you have to collect the waste, you have to process it, you have to produce products and then distribute those. What's, yeah. what's been some of the hardest components? Well, I think the, the hardest of all is something that's even before everything you mentioned, because you're yeah. absolutely right. That is the structure of what we do. Yeah. But let's take a step back. You know, right now, everywhere in the world, uh, and I can say this, I mean, we have offices in 26 countries, so I have a sense of sort of what the global recycling uh, methods are. What I've noticed all around the world, it's what is recyclable is always the same thing, whether you're in advanced recycling markets like Japan and Germany or emerging recycling markets like uh, Argentina or Hungary. Now, the, uh, uh, what is recyclable is always aluminum, paper, 
glass, PET, which is number one plastic, like a soda bottle, and HDPE, which is number two plastic, which is like a laundry uh, detergent bottle. Mm -hmm. Those are the five things that are typically recyclable. Now, why is it that those are what's globally recyclable and everything else ends up in the garbage? It has nothing to do with technical ability of the waste. It has everything to do with money. It always aluminum. comes down to that, yeah. <laughs> always, <laughs> unfortunately, right? Um, aluminum is so valuable that uh, after the cost of collecting it and processing it, you can still make money at the uh, what you call converted waste, you know, the right. find aluminum. But everything else, 80% of all the consumer goods that exist, like, you know, the headphones you're wearing, the microphone you're talking to, the clothing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you have on, um, maybe a pen you have nearby and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are not not recyclable because they technically can't be. Uh, they can be. They're not recyclable because it costs more to collect and process than mm. the material is worth. Makes sense, Which yeah. gets us to our big, you know, predicating business question. For us, it's all about finding a stakeholder who's willing to fund the recycling of something today not recyclable. It's that mm -hmm. funding source, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Always comes down to money, right? So what funding sources have we found? Uh, one very good one has been consumer product brands, uh, you know, like Colgate or L'Oreal or Kraft who want to proactively fund the recycling of their waste because it uh, uh, solves an issue of their product. You can imagine why the, you know, the benefits there come. Yeah. That's one. The second has been factories who may want to move towards zero waste and pay to recycle something that's today not recyclable. It could even be consumers. We've recently launched a platform where consumers can buy uh, TerraCycle zero waste boxes and recycle something that they couldn't recycle before. And even cities have started coming on board where like the city of New Orleans, the city of Vancouver, uh, uh, Victoria, uh, St. Louis are all now running TerraCycle, in this case cigarette recycling platforms because they want to fund the recycling of cigarette waste and they don't want the litter on their streets. So the real question is how do you get the funding? Because once you have the funding, Right. It's just sort of one foot in front of the other, figuring out how do you collect it, how do you process right. it, and how do you make it exciting. Yeah. So how do you get spread the word? Because obviously it's hard to get in every single city, every, every single place. How do you, what do you find best? Like I'm in Chicago, yeah. right? Yeah. Everyone should know about TerraCycle. They don't. Absolutely. How do you yeah. spread the word to get, to get everyone to do it, it's know a, about it and a, then do it? Yeah. It's a good question. So we deploy a range of, uh, of methods. Um, the first thing we do is we uh, really focus on huge volumes of publicity. Um, me talking to you now will hopefully educate more people uh, towards what TerraCycle is doing. And uh, what's really interesting today in the world of publicity is that if you really make the job of the uh, journalist easier, you know, you become accessible, mm -hmm. you give photos, videos, all this. You know, you can really uh, uh, use the system because there's a lot of content that needs to be put out by the by the journalist, and there's not enough people to do it. Right? It's a general issue, mm -hmm. and so we're, we've been able to uh, become so good at this that we average 21 articles every day. Uh, before talking wow. to you, I was just doing a national news broadcast for a ch I think uh, some news program that came down today. So that's one example: is copious amounts of publicity. Right. You do that by d being good at you know, like being good to the to the journalist, making it easy. But you also you know need an interesting story, something you know. And, and uh, figuring out how to package that story. Your story is obviously interesting. <laughs> yes, so. but everyone has an interesting story. It right. comes out to how do you package it, right? Because you just, you know, uh, you just have to understand how to tell stories that people get inspired by. So one is PR. W then the other is we really try to create what we call content marketing, which is uh, the idea we call it negative cost marketing, uh, or in other words, the thesis of that is why pay to be the con sorry why pay to be the advertising when you can get paid to be the content. Right. So that starts with blogging. We blog for about 100 major blogs from the New York Times, Tree Hugger, and Huffington Post, and many others. Forbes, yeah, right, yeah. Exactly, yeah. right. And that, again, allows us to get more content out, maybe even get a little bit of a paycheck, minimal at best, but still better than zero. Then once we do lots of blogging, we write books. Um, I'm actually, someone just brought, came to my desk to have me sign some books. These are the uh, two books uh, that we've already published. One is on the theory of garbage. One is on the story of TerraCycle. Yes. There's another one coming out uh, in a few months with Harper Collins called Garbage is Great. Then there's a fourth one after that. But again, you get paid to create uh, for all intents yeah. and purposes, propaganda, right? Yeah, <laughs> propaganda, um, yeah. Well, I mean, call it what it is, right? Then the, after that, the cherry on the content marketing cake is perhaps having your own TV show. Um, and TerraCycle just finished filming uh, uh, a season of uh, our TV show called Human Resources. Congratulations. And, thank you. Uh, it's on the Pivot channel, became really well rated, and now we're about to film season three, which is uh, between February and June of 2015. Mm. But there, you know, we get paid a little bit more than a book, and this TV show airs in 30 countries. Countries, you know, millions of viewers again gets attention. So that's the type of stuff we do from a sort of call it marketing communications yeah. point of view.
We aggressively leverage social media because that's a great place to go, especially for companies like ours, which are cause-related in every type of platform, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, you name it. Even stuff I don't know about our marketing team, I'm sure, gets on. Um, and then uh, uh, we also do a lot of proactive outreach. We, in fact, have a department focused on this, which is partnering with NGOs and other large organizations to make mm -hmm. them aware and use our platform. But there's a whole other category that we do um, that I think is important for any sort of social business to think about, which is leveraging your partners. So today, the TerraCycle logo is on 60 billion packages per year, huh. explaining how that package is recyclable. Um, it's been in many commercials funded by companies like Johnson & Johnson, Capri Sun, and others who create TerraCycle commercials because it benefits them, but then again, it benefits us too. Mm -hmm. And we leverage both sides. We really focus on leveraging our partners because they simply have bigger reach. You know, Getting a message on, on say, Febreze's uh, Facebook page will reach more people today than TerraCycle's Facebook page. So we leverage that quite a bit, and there's nothing wrong. In fact, I really encourage people to leverage their partners because there's a lot out there. Tom, each one of these things are so much time, energy, and effort. How do you time manage everything? You, you just said four books, TV show. You then have processing millions of cigarette butts, 500 million juice pouches. Tell me about what's a, what's a typical day? How do you balance your time? Well, I mean, look, TerraCycle, you know, I, I stand on a lot of great people's shoulders. You know, mm -hmm. you're talking to me, but there's 120 people who work here who make this all happen. Mm -hmm. um, I get to luckily, you know, be the face of this and take a lot of the credit, but the credit really grows, goes to the people who work really hard day in, day out, and mm -hmm. there's over 100 teammates around the world who do this. And it's tremendous work. I can't, it's, there's no magic wand to this. It's tremendous work. Right. And, you know, in, in my role is this sort of has built up over the past 10 years. We are very conscious of, you know, how do we create the right systems, create change? The key thing for us, I think, from a corporate culture um, is, uh, uh, you know, first to be very exciting. I mean, our office, uh, uh, every office around the world is all built from garbage. You can yes. sort of Yeah, so thinking. show what is, that, what is that and what is it made of back behind you? Well, right behind me, this is my office. Yeah. These are all, it's my soda bottle wall. Um, we believe in fierce transparency, physically and yes. metaphorically. Uh, physically, you could see, you know, I don't have a door. You can come right in. Everyone, you know, can hear what we're talking about right now. Um, we have no walls anywhere. Um, it's just something very important. Um, so the executives don't have a C-suite. That just simply, that idea doesn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. we want to be within, you know, all together as a group trying to solve what we're out there to solve. Um, but we also believe in transparency, not just in the physicality, but in the, uh, in how we run. So, for example... There's maybe 15 departments at TerraCycle in 25 countries. So there's a lot of leaders. Each leader, every single month, as you'd expect, has to submit a very detailed report to me. I mean, that's pretty normal. But here's what's not normal. That report goes to every single employee in the company. Hmm. So if you joined our business, theoretically, as to say, as a low-level position um, uh, somewhere, you would get every report I get as the person who runs the company. That's very unique. Um, and we believe in those sort of things, making everything very transparent, no secrets, because the more then people can help and come up with ideas versus feeling like they don't really even know how they um, fit into the organization, what they do, and so on. So that's a really big part of how we run our business at TerraCycle and uh, the type of company we're trying to create. Yeah. And Tom, yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, obviously you have hundreds of employees now. It wasn't always like that. It was just you and probably a few other people to start. What were some of the big challenges and roadblocks you faced early on and how you got through them? Well, I think, you know, you have your, you know, your normal challenges, understanding the difference between P&L and cash flow, um, raising capital, you know, uh, managing people at a young age. I mean, I've been doing this for 11 years, but I'm 32 now. I started when I was 21, and uh, it wasn't always easy managing people twice or three times my age. Those are all the classic things. So I'm not going to sort of regale you with everything that's relatively normal. I think the biggest sort of learning through challenges that I faced is that yeah. um, in today's world, it, things move tremendously fast, mm -hmm. and you have to be very open to change, all right? I think the companies that sort of hit a great model and stick with it and don't change it are, are going to get stale and die, especially in today's world, which is moving way faster than the world moved even just 20 years ago. I mean, things, ideas move tremendously quick, and so one thing that we're very comfortable here is the idea of failure. Um, we want to test ideas. Yeah. We're totally fine if they fail, then learn from it, then change it again. Hopefully they go a bit better, but probably they'll fail. Then we learn from that. Then right. we change it again. They'll probably fail again. And that sort of approach, doing that with a smile and never sort of being down about it because 
if you get depressed about the failures, you never innovate. I mean, innovation is built on a mountain of failure. Yeah. And I think it's not about saying, well, what's this specific failure or this learning? Because it's different for every entrepreneur. It'll be different in every situation and time. It's more about being very comfortable to fail and learning from that versus getting down about it because then, you know, it's going to be tough. Yeah. What was one that you remember that you look back on that created a big turning point? One of the failures? Well, there was a number of turning points, but I'll give you maybe one of the biggest ones mm. is that we used to manufacture and convert all the waste ourselves. Where I'm sitting now used to be a factory with 300 employees um, converting waste into all sorts of different stuff. And we realized that, you know, as a business, focus on what is really unique to you and, and then leverage outsourcing uh, as much as possible because the infrastructure around the world is deep and tremendous and there's no need to, to replicate what already exists. So. Right. Today, TerraCycle has no manufacturing or processing at all. We outsource absolutely everything to a, to a network of hundreds of different companies. That allowed us to go to 26 countries. That allowed us to grow and to take on some pretty you know, gnarly challenges like cigarette uh, butt recycling, which we now do in 10 countries around the world, and other things that may not seem as hard but are quite hard, like you know, toothpaste tube and toothbrush recycling. But that idea of being nimble and letting go of everything except what you yourself are really good and innovative at, mm -hmm. which for us has nothing to do with operations. We run deep operations. We have 60 million people collecting in the TerraCycle platforms, but everything is outsourced, allowing us to really be able to adapt the systems to exactly what's going on in that country in that very moment. Yeah. Tom, so what type of garbage do you want to attack now? What is on your hit list that you just want to eliminate? Well, okay. Uh, my first, I love the really weird and difficult stuff because yeah, it's like uh, you know like like cigarette butts. You know, two years ago we sort of really hung our hat on hat on that, and it became yeah. a global story and a global success. Yeah. My next one, um, what I'd love to really do, and we're working on it, is uh, use femme hygiene products. Okay. I say that because that's maybe the pinnacle of nastiness from a consumer product point of view, and if you can solve that, it says to the public you can solve anything possible and anything that exists. Is that going to be, how, how difficult have you found that so far? Well, I mean, look, uh, if we really break it down and sort of, you know, take the joke out of it, because obviously it's sort of a funny, you know, sort of topic, is that you got two key questions, or really three questions to answer here on difficulty. Mm -hmm. One is how to collect it. In femme hygiene, there's a hazardous issue, right? Because it's going to be covered in bio, you know, like yeah. blood and, and other... Uh, Sounds horrible, yeah. Bod yeah, bodily materials can be transported, but you got to come up with the right trans, like the right collection box, the right system, and how, who and how it's transported, yeah. where it's checked in. There's a whole operational question there that has answers to it, but that's not easy. The second then is how to process, and there the real key step is just simply decontamination, uh, uh, which we try to do not with water, but more with radiation, with gamma radiation. Mm -hmm. That destroys any of the E. coli, salmonella, other things that may be present, you know, mm. uh, different pathogens that may be inside the material. Yeah. Um, and uh, from there, it's actually relatively easy uh, to process once you've uh, 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 sterilized it. Sterilization yeah. is the biggest uh, piece yeah. of it. And then the third question, uh, which is also quite uh, challenging in this particular example, is how do you get people to actually do this? Right. right? Yeah. Which is, has nothing to do with the physical collection or solution. It has everything to do with what is the, the, the spin you put on it to get people to get excited. You know, uh, uh, and that's the marketing and promotional angle. So and that is worked? also yeah. What's right? worked with getting people excited about sending you their femme hygiene product products? Well, I mean, it's not launched yet, so this is an oh, idea okay, okay. We're working on. Um, but uh, but let me give you an example of something that's you know pretty gross, like cigarette waste. Yeah. Um, there we've nailed all three examples, right? So on collection, the answer was multiple systems. We have citywide systems, uh, which are now available in the city of New Orleans, city of Vancouver, Victoria, soon in Mel Melbourne, Sydney, Tokyo, Paris, I mean, all over the world, where you can simply put into a TerraCycle bin your used cigarette waste, and it's every 20 yards uh, in the city in densely populated areas. We also have a national collection platform. You can go to our website, TerraCycle.com, uh, join the platform, download free shipping labels, send us your cigarette waste, funded in that case by the tobacco industry. And the third is actually pocket collections, where we give away little pocket sachets that have shipping printed on it. You put it in your pocket, uh, you uh, put in your cigarettes there, and then when you're done, you put them uh, in the mail. So we, it's a blend. You'll notice it's not one answer. It's a blend of answers because every consumer behaves differently. And it's about giving lots of opportunities to participate uh, no matter what your mindset is or what your, uh, your level of willingness is. Yeah. 
Solution is easy on, I mean, now, you know, it's, it's a relatively straightforward process. We shred the cigarettes, separate the organics from the inorganics. The organics, like the ash, tobacco, paper, are composted into compost or fertilizer. And the, uh, organ uh, the inorganic, which is the cellulose acetate filter, uh, is made into a compression or extrusion moldable plastic. Uh, by the way, the thing that makes a cigarette butt is the exact same thing that makes up plastic uh, 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 glass frames. So really? If you have a pair of sunglasses. Wow. Like, you know, the ones that are plastic, like your, your glasses are metal, but if you had plastic, yes. that's the same thing as a cigarette butt. Wow. Um, and then the idea of promotion, you know, how do we make sure that we can get people, you asked about awareness. Um, here's one example. Um, I just, I don't personally smoke, but I happen, this was sent to me uh, by one of our tobacco partners in Canada. This is the biggest brand of cigarettes in Canada. It's called Demorier. Okay. And there, I don't know if you can see it, it's the TerraCycle logo and yeah, yeah. the package is explaining how you can now recycle it, right? That's amazing, You've yeah. You've got to do that too or people will never become aware. Yeah. But I want to, in this, address one big thing, yeah. which is that TerraCycle, and even the very concept of recycling is not the answer to garbage at all. The answer, if you don't want cigarette waste on your streets, stop smoking. Right. Right. Stop consuming. That's the fundamental yeah. issue, and I don't want people yeah, to have that's a perception a good point. that we can um, justify ra rapid, rampant, massive overconsumption, which is the case today, uh, uh, by recycling everything. Right. That is that's yeah. something that's very important that we don't uh, uh, think because that is going to keep uh, creating a lot of environmental issues, not just garbage, but all the issues of product, you know, extracting yeah. all these raw materials from the earth, forestry, you know, mining, oil drilling, all the transportation that's involved and so on yeah. and so forth. The reason we have environmental problems today is basically predicated on the fact that we buy too much stuff. Yeah, that's a great point. I love how you think it's the source is actually just consuming less. How do you get well, people to consume less? This is this is a hard one, you know, because, yeah. and that's why I proactively wanted to mention it to yeah. you because, you know, for me to be able to get funding from consumer product brands to put out these platforms, I have to, you know, respect their wishes as well, and I'm not going to be able to stand on a stoke on, on the soapbox they fund and talk about buy less of less don't product. buy right right right. So yeah. I use the opportunities I can, like talking with you or in the books I've written or on the TV show, to talk about it as much as I can because, at the end of the day, many times especially in today's environmental you know, uh, uh, state where there's a lot of environmental issues, we are looking at like how do you solve the plastic ocean gyre problem? I'm sure you've heard about that quite a bit and there's a lot of innovators thinking about it. How do you mm -hmm. solve what like TerraCycle does is non-recyclables or other things unrelated like how do you solve you know, the fact that there is less and less forests every year or you know, and you, I mean, there's a whole laundry list. Yeah. The problem is all the thinking is about how to solve the problem. There's very little thinking about how to solve the reason the problem exists to begin with. Right, right. Right, yeah. and I want to just put that out there so that anyone listening, you know, to this can, you know, maybe sink their teeth into actually solving mm -hmm. the reason. It's like preventative medicine, right? Right, right. Don't solve, you know, don't give me the, uh, the pill right. because I have the disease. After you've had a heart attack, you need to prevent the arteries from building up, yes. Right, so I don't, yeah. you know, instead of giving me whatever, Cialis, or sorry, that's the wrong drug. Um, the, uh, what is the thing that you take for uh, after a uh, heart attack? Like uh, Lipitor, they, right? Yeah, they Lipitor yeah. for cholesterol, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so say, like, instead of giving me Lipitor, how do I not get the heart attack to begin with? Right, right. Right, that's the key question, because right now we wait for the heart attack, and then, and the problem is, that's where all the excitement goes. Like, we get lots of credit, but we're more the Lipitor than we are the preventative medicine. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Tom, who's been a big influence for you, because obviously to push forward and do this is inspiring. Who's inspired you? Who's been a big influence and mentor? You know, for me, the um, the people, uh, and it's not one person, but it's that generation mm -hmm. of social entrepreneurs that emerged mm -hmm. in the 70s. It's, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, Ben from Ben and Jerry's uh, or Gary Hirschberg, who started Stonyfield Yogurt or mm -hmm. Seth, who started Honest Tea. And I can, mm -hmm. you know, list a whole list of these guys. Mm -hmm. But they're the ones who who gave you know an a opportunity for social entrepreneurship to be um, acceptable mm -hmm. and get funding so you know for me it's a lot easier to be even more aggressive now and really push the the business models to whole new things but i can do that because it's built on the on the backbone of organic yogurt on organic iced tea you know these classic products that were moved to become more mm -hmm. social once those were accepted and that really started emerging like right around the early 70s and you know, obviously, is now you know really mature. Um, that's what allows you know companies like mine uh, to succeed because it required a base. Um, without people who already get this, you know, something that is so different as a business model like TerraCycle can never even dream to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was watching one video, and you're you're talking back and forth with Kevin O'Leary, 
who's yeah. challenging you on can you even make money with this? Well, here's my big problem, right? And I, I really appreciate that he, um, he uh, you know, sort of, uh, 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 you know, pushed that topic when we did the interview, right. is that he said something that I think uh, is really important. Um, and I've noticed this. I give a lot of lectures at business schools, you know, I, you know whether it's Wharton or Harvard or wherever. Mm -hmm. And I have this joke for my, myself. I ask the students who are all my age, basically, what's the purpose of business? And just like what uh, O'Leary would say is exactly what all the students say, profit profit and if we didn't say it profit right right and that's exactly what he said you know he said well isn't the only purpose of business profit and I have a fundamental problem with that I think the purpose of business is what the business produces or what the service of the business provides I mean mm -hmm. do you go to work for the money you get paid or do you go to work and do these you know uh, uh, podcasts and interviews uh, because of getting great information out to the public and that you enjoy right. doing yeah. right I think it's I hope it's the latter right right, right. and most 99% of the world isn't the shareholder, that's 1%, 99% of the world goes to the work because of what service or product the company makes, right? And that is the fundamentally most important thing. I think profit is critical. I don't want to devalue profit, right. but profit is an indicator. It's sort of like body mass index, right? Yeah. You need some level of fat to right. survive or you're going to die. So if you don't have profit, you will die because you will just go bankrupt and that's death. But do you really need to be gargantuanly obese, like uh, a company that, you know, like uh, the tobacco companies that make, you know, eight right. billion in profit? Uh, sorry, eight billion in revenue and two billion in profit. That I think, you know, the absurd and 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 uh, almost tunnel vision focus on profit is one of is is a mistake, and it's not thinking about the long term. It's not thinking about you know the overall function of the business because if the point of business is only returned to shareholders then it's only benefiting a highly like a tiny tiny percentage of the world population yeah and that I mean, just I doesn't make sense i loved your rebuttal and anyone should watch that youtube video to uh when you're talking to kevin o'leary but but then you, you say that and then at the end you just throw in subtly like we do make 20 million dollars you know you you well, throw in that well, it's my little point to him yes. to say you know because here's one of the things people think, and I'm sure he did too, is that social business is like you know selling organic soap at your local uh, farmers market. Mm -hmm. I you know one of the things that TerraCycle really tries to show, and that's why we want to be high growth, aggressive growth. You know, is we want to show we're just like a dot com startup, and we're a real business. You know, mm -hmm. and growth is also important for us for that very reason because there's much more credibility when I can tell O'Leary that hey, here's my philosophy, and by the way. We're a multi-million-dollar global business, right? right? Yes. Versus, here's my philosophy. Oh, and I'm you know barely paying myself. Right. Yes. I, that was it. Was a great debate. I love. It wasn't even debate, but it's just you making your points. Um, so, but I, I do appreciate it because you know he allowed that topic to be put out there. Yeah. You know, if it was just an interviewer, it's like, hey, isn't this great? And tell us what you do, and you know all that, then no one would remember, yeah. right? And it's good to push because these are the questions. I mean, if we really want to live in, I think, a great, you know, stable, sustainable, you know, uh, society, we need to consume less and rethink the purpose yeah. of business. Yeah. I'm, I'm a diehard capitalist. Right? I love it, but mm -hmm. I think any idea taken too much to its extreme, you know, has to be uh, checked a little bit. Yes, yes. That's why I bring him up because I am not the pushy personality. But if it comes from his words, then you'll talk about it. Um, there you, go. you know, Tom. Since it's Inspired Insider, my one of my biggest questions is, what was the lowest point you had, and then how you fought through that? Well. Um, so I'll answer this in two ways. Like the specific lowest point for us was uh, near the beginning. It's easy, you know, the beginning is very raw, uh, and there's a lot less sort of insulation, if you will, for uh, for for failure. You know, here there'd have to be a tremendous amount of negatives that happened before any real fundamental issues occurred. But back in the day, uh, you know, when we first began, it's very significantly more raw. And uh, I remember a time when I was living in the photocopy room of our basement office. I'd already dropped out of uh, school at the time, and uh, we had five hundred bucks in our bank account. And uh, uh, we were at a position where, you know, it was very, very dark. Had no idea how I'm going to pay the bill. No idea how I'm going to even, like, you know, turn on the lights tomorrow. Yeah, it's tough. And it was very hard. But here's what I've learned. And there's been other moments. That's maybe the most. But there's been other moments where, you know, it's sort of you come to a turning point. Maybe the idea that you were thinking on at that time is not working as well. And you need to make a fundamental alignment. What's been magical? Every time there's been such ridiculous negatives. Yeah. It's also been the birth of the biggest innovations we've ever had. Mm. Um, the, when we had no money, uh, uh, at the very beginning in 2003, we decided to start packaging our uh, first product, liquid worm poop, liquid, uh, uh, yeah. like, you know, basically uh, uh, worm poop, which is organic waste fed to worms, fertilized, uh, uh, liquefied, yes. 
we started packaging it in used soda bottles because we couldn't we just couldn't afford any packaging so we went through people's garbage that actually became a fundamental innovation and is why that product ended up within months getting listed at Walmart, Home Depot, Target, you know, mm. everywhere, right? Um, once we realized that we were losing, another example of a big turning point when we were realizing that we were making all the products ourselves and losing a lot of money in the process because oh. we were trying to compete at Walmart and Home Depot and mm -hmm. large big box, mm -hmm. we decided to stop that completely uh, and outsource uh, everything, as I'd already described earlier. Mm -hmm. Massive, positive innovation and turning point, but came from desperation and struggle yeah. but you know they say this about you know there's a lot of good metaphors in nature if you want a rose to bloom and have tremendous amount of roses on it what you need to do is hurt it you need to put it through pain right so if you have a rose and you cut it back a lot which is very painful for the rose mm -hmm. right then it's going to create a lot of roses and it's going to look beautiful and it's going to really work hard but if you don't cut it and let it you know just go all over the place it won't even have a single rose on it and so you know, there's something to be said. Pain yeah. creates strength. You know, right. uh, you know, it's, it's sort of that thing. What, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And there's right. a lot of truth in that. Yeah. And especially in business. But as long as you come with the attitude of, how are we going to solve this? Not deep depression, like it's over. Because then it will be over. Right. So that's what you think about. You think about this pain is just making me stronger. And I, there's something on the other end that's going to be yeah. more innovative. Yeah, and look, don't get me wrong, I don't seek it out, okay? Um, absolutely, you know, I, I hope to avoid it because, uh, you know, I'd like to live in a stress-free world. Right. But I always remember all these innovative moments every time there's stress and I, that really helps me get through because what basically the stress is saying is what you're doing now isn't quite working, adapt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Tom, on the other end of it, what's been one of the proudest moments that you look back on? You know, it may seem small, but... Um, the, the moments, and it's not one moment, but it's sort of these moments when I'm in a faraway land, like, uh, you know, Israel. This actually happened. I was out there a few weeks ago, and uh, I'm finished my work, you know, very, very grueling day, and I get uh, uh, on the airplane, and I'm heading home, and the stewardess uh, uh, comes up and says, you know, would you like a bag of chips? You know, like they give away little salty snacks, and I say, sure, and I get the bag of chips, and it's an Israeli chip bag you know, with Hebrew writing, and I turn it over, there's the TerraCycle logo hmm. in Hebrew, I, I, I don't know, you know, I couldn't, I don't speak Hebrew, so I couldn't tell you, but there it says, collect uh, uh, and recycle this chip bag through TerraCycle, and I was Amazing. like, that, yeah. it's not the money, it's not anything, it's not the, you know, the amount of articles that happen or anything mm -hmm. like that, it's, it's when I can, you know, see that there's real impact happening yeah. all over the world. Yeah. That to me just tickles, you know, tickles me and it's exactly yeah. what I'm fighting for. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So to leave people, Tom, what should they do now? Now that they've heard you, what should they do now? Like should they go to the TerraCycle site? What what so, should they do to make an impact with, with I'll say what there's you're a saying? number of things they should do. Yeah, yeah. First, stop buying stuff. Okay. Okay. That would if anything happens, that would be awesome. Okay. Or really think about what you buy. And if you do buy, try to buy durable and used objects. Um, as much as you can, try to really, you know, be conscious of the f of instead of buying packaged food, buy fresh fruits and vegetables. You'll be healthier, and you're going to create less uh, negatives on your body and the planet. So that's the first. Um, the second is specifically with TerraCycle. Go to our website at TerraCycle.com and send us your non-recyclable waste. There's many free programs. There are some paid ones as well, but send us your garbage, right? Yeah. Um, and then the third is hopefully think about waste differently. Think about waste as nature does, which is as something of value, and not the way we humans do as something that we need to pay to get rid of. And then maybe finally, you know, if you are thinking about starting a business or uh, becoming, you know, in, in the entrepreneurial world, consider the concept of social business versus just, uh, you know, sheer profit-driven uh, 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 classic business. Let's call it. Yeah. Tom, this has been super valuable. Thank you for the insights. Everyone should also check out your books and go on their page, their products page. Just, it's amazing. There's 13 pages of really cool products, what they're made of. And, you know, I really appreciate it, Tom. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to chat with you. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye.